Come on, how many ready for God's word today? Come on, say amen today. It's good to see you guys. Uh, grateful to have you in the house of God today. And if you're a guest today, uh, man, we just wanna say thank you for coming. Check out uh, the newer tent out there. Make sure someone knows you're here. Uh, love to get you connected. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. I uh, can't wait to see what God's gonna do there. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing time. Uh, well, today I wanna introduce my wife. She's gonna be preaching today. Come on, y'all make some noise for that. And, uh, and before she comes though, I just wanna just share a few things about that. Uh, and, uh, and she's not just preaching because it's Mother's Day. Obviously, she is the spiritual mom of this church, and sometimes we need to hear uh, from spiritual mom voices. But let me just say a few things because uh, just, just to let you know, I don't feel like I have to say this, but uh, there are some churches out there that don't believe that women should be allowed to preach. And I just want you to know they're wrong, okay? I just want you to know that. Uh, they're wrong. Uh, I, and, and what I mean by that is not bad, but there are a lot of people that believe that, that uh, man, only a man should preach or only a man should be a pastor. And uh, I think it's a lot of misguided misinterpretations of scripture. I don't believe that women should preach just because it's 2024. Um, I believe that women should preach because the Bible speaks about it. It talks about it. If you go all the way back to the book of Acts, which is the church age that we're living in right now, in Acts chapter two, there was 120 people that were all followers of Jesus, men Men and women. And if you actually study scripture, Jesus was the one who elevated women more than anybody else in history. And it was in Acts chapter two where the Holy Spirit came and filled everyone with the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, literally thousands of people showed up in Jerusalem. They said, what's going on? Uh, we're hearing all these people speak in our native language. Peter stood up and said, hey, y'all, this is what Malachi, this is what was prophesied in Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on men and women, on sons and daughters, and they will prophesy. You know the word prophesy literally means to speak the word of God, to preach the word of God. And we are living, I believe, since Acts chapter two in the day where the Holy Spirit is being poured out. And I believe this, not just for my wife, I've got three amazing daughters and a church full of women that need to know that God has anointed you, called you, can use you to do amazing and great things uh, for the kingdom of God. Um, and I also believe this with all my heart is that there are some things only a mom or a wife or a woman can speak to. I believe that. I, I believe that there are certain things that, that there is an anointing of God uh, that the male and the female, that God created them both in the image of God. And so, uh, man, I'm just honored to have her come preach today. My wife was called into ministry before I was. Uh, I didn't know her then, but when she was 16 years old, gave her life to Jesus, got called into ministry, went to Bible school. Uh, that's where we met uh, in Springfield, Missouri, was preaching at age 17 and 18 years old. Uh, it was actually a, a, in a message that she preached as a, a young adult that her father-in-law, uh, uh, who was now like our, her stepdad, who is now uh, our grandfather, our, our kid's grandfather, got saved while she was preaching. Um, and I just know there's an anointing of God on her life. Uh, she loves this church more than anybody I know. Uh, she's one of our executive pastors here. She oversees all the central ministries from, from uh, Next Gen, uh, to guest experience, all the things that happen here. And so, uh, man, uh, I know some people say when they introduce their spouse that this is my better half. Some people uh, just kind of say that. I mean that with all my heart. Uh, my wife is absolutely the greatest uh, human being I know, and I'm excited to learn from her this morning. So would you guys do me your fa best favor? Let's roll with honor. Let's show her some honor. She comes to bring the word of God together. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to honor our moms too. Uh, my mom, she watches <laughs> at nine o'clock. She always like, where's Gracie? Where's she always knows who's sitting by me. And then if the, one of them's missing, she wants to know where they're at. She'd be like, where's Gracie sitting? Why is she not there? And so, hey, mom, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. And also Brian's mom, you know, she's such a spiritual leader in my life. She has been since Brian and I met. So we're so thankful for amazing moms that have guided us and molded us to where we're at today. But we're gonna start off funny, okay, because we just need to laugh because as moms, it's the best thing we can do. So, okay, moms, here we go. I'm gonna read some things that only a mom would say. And you're gonna have to raise your hand if you're guilty of saying this, okay? Here we go. Things only a mom would say. You need to wear pants when company comes over. <laughs> have you ever said that? I have said that, yes. Who peed on the seat? Why would you lick that? 
toilet paper is not an option. <laughs> Do you want me to turn this car around? <laughs> when in our hearts, we're not going to, right? We're like, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Just tell me the truth, I won't get mad. <laughs> Such a lie. Such a lie. If you don't stop crying, I'm gonna give you something to cry about. <laughs> Eat your food. There are starving people in other countries. That's a classic. When you fall out of the tree and break both your legs, don't come running to me. You could have been dead in a ditch. I've said that to my daughter when she was the first at college and she didn't reply. The first thing I thought, she's probably dead in a ditch. She's probably dead somewhere. She won't reply, she's dead. What if you get kidnapped? Or the, my children, what if I get kidnapped? Don't worry, they're gonna bring you back. <laughs> it's fun being a mom, we say things that we would never say to our friends, right? But definitely things we would say to our children. So if you don't know this, um, I actually do preach every single Sunday, in case you didn't know that. I preach back in kids ministry. That's right. <laughs> So I'm preaching to women that are gonna lead and men that are gonna lead. I'm just helping plant the seeds a little bit younger. And so I, pre I mostly preach at the 11 o'clock. Um, so you guys usually see me 11 o'clock. I may be brand new to them. But um, so kids ministry, we're staying in order of the fruits of the spirit. Now, if you don't know, we've been in a series called Family Fruits. And we've been staying in order, but we kind of jumped order a little bit in here. Um, if you know our scripture we've been using in this series, uh, Pastor Brian has been teaching is Galatians 5. And that's been our scripture that's been our go-to scripture. And I think we have that up here for you. In Galatians 5, 22, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, in kids ministry, we stayed in order. So we did patience last week. Now we do this challenge in kids ministry, so they're actually gonna help me preach today by something they did last week. So what we do is when they come in, we'll introduce the new fruit and we'll say, okay, I want you to draw something, for example, when we did joy. Draw me something that brings you joy. It can be food, it can be something you've done. So last week I said, I want you to draw something you've had to wait for, and it wasn't fun to wait. Oh, you get some fun stuff, right? So I'm actually gonna show you some things my kids drew last week of things they've had to wait for. I bet some of you are gonna know these. Don't worry, I didn't put their names on here. Okay, here's the first one. This is pretty good. A plant to grow, that's, pretty, that's true, right? Uh, fishing, I mean, is that so cute? That is so cute. Okay, let's see the next one. Um, waiting in line, look, I like this one. Look at the mad face, me. <laughs> at the back. Nobody likes to wait. Isn't that funny? That they, okay, let's see the next one. Waiting for a phone. Go parents, you keep making them wait, right? This is so, waiting to go to Disney. I was like, take your baby to Disney. Okay, let's see the next one. Um, my cat to move. So I don't know if this cat is just lazy or if it's alive. I don't know, I didn't ask. But he's been waiting. Um, so if you don't know, 11 o'clock is our Espanol. They come in to our 11 o'clock. So this little boy wrote Pedro. Did I say it right? That's a dog, it's Pedro. Pedro. Okay, I'm sorry. I butchered it. He wants a dog. I was like, I'm gonna go get you a puppy. No, I wouldn't do that. Okay, I think that, is that another one or is that my last one? Oh, this is, oh, this is my noodles to be bun. <laughs> Just done. Is that the kid? And this is my absolute favorite for all you moms waiting for dinner because she talks. <laughs> to, she talks long. And he's waiting. Oh, I love kids. I love kids. You know, they're just, they show you what patience is. So today, we're talking about patience in here. And what a perfect subject to give to moms, right? We are the most patient people. How many of you waited for your kids to get their shoes on or pick something up? I saw this meme, it said, I put stuff on the stairs in the hope that one day, you know, it's just, a, it's gonna go up there one day, right? And it never does. We're so patient, we're so patient. So let me give you the title of today. It's called The Path of Patience. Now what's gonna be fun about this, it's not a path to patience. It's the path of patience. Because it's not anything you're ever gonna just arrive at and just, I have it. 
right? It's not like you wait in line and you just get that patience and I'm good. It's a path that you choose to be on. And that's gonna be the title for today. Now, before I give you the, we're gonna go right into the one thing to know. Now, this is the thing about Mother's Day. You know, I love mamas. They, I just love when moms, we can get together and we can talk about things that nobody else understands, but we just get it, right? But this is the thing about today. I'm gonna challenge you today. Of course, I love you and honor you. And my three girls are the best testimony of this. Uh, the, my girls know I love them, but they know I challenge them all the time. And they're like, yes. Because I never want them to stay where they're at. I always want them to think differently, think bigger, think better, think, well, what have you ever thought about what it was like for them? You know, always trying to get them to think from a different perspective or look at the other person. I never just want them to stay where they're at. I always want them to be better. So today I'm going to challenge you a little bit. So I need you to be big girls, okay? So don't get offended and don't be like, well, that wasn't, you might want Pastor Brian to preach next Mother's Day and just, because... <laughs> But I'm just gonna give you some challenge. You're gonna take some notes because I'm telling you, this is a message that God wants you to hear today. And we're gonna learn from someone in the Bible. It's, it's me bringing it, but you're not learning from me. You're gonna learn from people in the Bible and these stories wouldn't be in here if they weren't there for us to learn from. So we're gonna learn from some women today and it's gonna challenge you. So here we go. So I'm gonna go right into the one thing to know. Your one thing to know is patience it's not something you arrive at, but a path for you to be on. So today we're gonna talk about what is it like to be on that path of patience. And we're gonna learn from some moms from the Bible. Now we're gonna learn from some Old Testament mamas. They're crazy. They're some crazy mamas, but we're all a little crazy, right? And so we're gonna go through the Old Testament and we're gonna go through some moms and we're gonna learn what it's like to be on a path of patience. Okay, so we're going to go all the way back with Abraham, okay? We're going to start with Abraham and Sarah. Now, this is the thing about Abraham and Sarai. She could not, her name was Sarai before she became Sarah. Now, if you don't know, she could not have children. Now, I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 16. Like I said, it's just all in Genesis right at the beginning, okay? And I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord's prevented me from having children. So go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed. He didn't put up a fight for that, did he? And Sarah, with Sarai's proposal. So there is no hesitation. So she's like, well, I can't have kids. So I guess we'll just do it this way. So when we get down, so she becomes very old and so does Abram and they get older. And then what happens is then she's promised a child and she, you gotta understand, she old, okay? Now I had Brayden later in life than when I had Trinity. They're 12 years apart. I remember having Trinity and we were in our 20s. And man, I had all the energy in the world, right? It was like, we did flashcards, right? She wasn't allowed to touch candy. Don't let her look at the TV. She'll be, I mean, I think she was four before we let her watch TV. It was, I mean, we were insane, okay? We were like those parents that hear, right? You're like, oh, you'll get over it, right? We were those parents. I had so much time. But then we had Brayden 12 years later. And there's so many times that she's like, I can't believe you let him do that. I said, yeah, I know. We're so tired. <laughs> We're just so tired. We're like, he'll be fine. We're like, one out of four, we're doing pretty good. Turned out good. The two in the middle, they'll be fine. Eight, eight, and we're like, eh, it could go either way. You just get tired. So I couldn't imagine. Here's Sarai, and she's, an angel comes and says, you're going to have a Lord. You're going to have a child. And the first thing she does is laugh. I'm going to read Genesis 21. And I am reading from my Bible. I just want you to know, in kids ministry, like I let them come up and read out of my Bible. And I tell them about the Bible app and I tell them, and I love that. But there's just nothing like having a Bible in your hand. So I encourage you as parents, get your kids a Bible, let it get all messed up. I can, if you were here, the sermon um, that Brian preached with the water hose on stage, was anybody here for that? Yeah, and he sprayed me. Do you remember that? Yeah, there's the page, he sprayed me. It's all wrinkled. Every time I open that, I remember my husband spraying me. 
I thought about bringing a hose to the body. Okay, 21, verse 8. So, so she laughed when the angel told her she's, because she's old. I, if someone told me, I'd be, I don't think so. I think you got it wrong. Or you got the wrong person. She laughed, but that was showing that she doubted. Even when they confronted her, Sarah, you laughed. She goes, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But she did. She doubted. Now, go to Genesis 21, verses 8 through 10. When, now, here she had her son, Isaac. She was promised a son. She gets Isaac. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abram prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah, she's now Sarah. God changed her name. Saw Ishmael. Now, remember, let's go back. What did I read? When she couldn't have children, she said to her husband, go sleep with my servant. Maybe we'll have children. That's the way God maybe had it planned. So this is the other son. This is Ishmael, his other son from the servant. But Sarai saw Ishmael, the son of Abram, and her Egyptian servant, Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abram and demanded, get rid of this slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. Now remember, her idea, now she's mad. Does that sound like women? <laughs> what? Where I did never like, how dare you do that? <laughs> no, don't say preach. <laughs> but here we go. Here's Isaac, her only son, and I am not, I have an only boy, and I'll tell you. There's something about boys. They just get your heart. My girls can tell me, oh, mom, you look nice. But if Brayden goes, mom, you look pretty today, I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want, buddy? You want ice cream? <laughs> yeah. You want to get on Amazon? <laughs> it's just something about a boy. So here's Isaac, Sarah's sweet little boy. She is her only, she's waited so long for this child to be born, okay? And she will do anything to protect Isaac. And in fact, Ishmael and Isaac are kind of like being brothers. Ishmael's kind of taunting Isaac, and she's like, I want him gone. He, he's making fun of my son. He's giving him a hard time. I want him out of here. And Abraham does. He's sad. He's super sad about it, but he does it anyway. So now here's Isaac, the only child. Now, remember that, because we're going to come back to that, because I don't think that was God's plan for him to only be an only child. I think he was meant to grow up with his brother. But again, sometimes when we're not patient, we come up with our own plan. And we think we're protecting them, but he's my only baby. I don't even make fun of him. I don't want anything to happen, no conflict, nothing hard. So I'm gonna get rid of everything that's hard for him and just protect him. Because that's what mamas do. It is what mamas do. But was that God's plan and process for Isaac's life? So, okay, so here goes Isaac. He's ready to get married. Okay, so we're going to skip down to the next one. And I think we're going to list these. Were the other ones up here? Okay, awesome. So now we're, we, we're done with Abraham. So here's Isaac. Isaac's ready to get married. He finds Rebecca. Now, we're still in Genesis 25. I'm going to give you lots of scripture. You can go back and read it. 25, 21. So here's Isaac. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on the behalf of his wife, because guess what? His wife can't bear children either. Isn't that fascinating? So Rebecca can't have children. So Isaac's pleading on her behalf and says, she's unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer. And Rebecca became pregnant with twins. So here's where Esau and Jacob come into play. Now, what's fascinating about Esau and Jacob, dad has a favorite, Mom has a favorite, and I don't think they're too shy about it. Now, remember, Isaac grew up as an only child. I don't know if he knew how to love too, because the way he was taught was he got everything. So he had his favorite. He's just like, well, that's the way my mom treated me, so I'm going to pick my favorite, and Rebecca picked her favorite. And from that moment, the boys were raised completely different, almost immediately they were against each other. And if you don't know, Esau became the hunter, Jacob became hanging out with mom and cooking, and I mean, they just became buddies. And here to the point where, I, where um, even Jacob tricks his brother out of his birthright, but we're gonna go past that 
where Rebecca comes up with a plan. Mom comes up with a plan. And she's like, listen, your dad is about to bless Esau, the firstborn, but I have a plan. We're gonna trick your dad and we're gonna have him bless you. Now, I wanna read a scripture to you, Genesis 27, because this is fascinating. Jacob actually questions his mom. Genesis 27, 12 through 13. What if my father touches me? Because remember, Esau was really hairy, Jacob was not. He'll see that I'm trying to trick him and then he's gonna curse me instead of bless me. But his mother replied, then let the curse fall on me. My son, just do what I tell you. Go out and get the goats for me. So here's a mom willing to say, I don't want the curse to happen to you, so just get out of the way and let it happen to me. Now, as moms, are we ever guilty of trying to let anything come against our kids? We'll say, I'll deal with it. I'll take it on. I don't want you to go through that. And so here she was, come up with a plan because she wanted the child she chose. I don't ever remember a scripture where she asked God who was supposed to get the blessing. She came up with her own plan. And she said, no, I choose Jacob, not Esau. And so they came up with the whole plan. Now, it happens, he blesses Jacob. This is the sad part that you probably don't even realize in the scripture. It happens, Esau gets so angry that she actually has to send Jacob away. And Jacob has to leave for his life and Rebecca never sees him again. Could you imagine the plan that she came up with stole her time with her son that she loved. And he had to leave and they never saw each other again. Okay, now we're gonna keep, stay with me. We're gonna go through one more and I promise you we're gonna wrap it all up. So here, now here's Jacob. Jacob's ready to get married, okay? So he goes, he wants to marry a girl named Rachel and she's beautiful. And it's so sad. She has a sister who's younger, Leah. And it's so sad in the Bible. They said, she's not real pretty, basically. It's so sad. But the father says, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you can have my daughters. So let's go to Genesis 29, because here's where Jacob marries actually Leah, then Rachel. 29, 26. Now, it's not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn, but wait until the bridal week is over, then we'll give you, Rachel, to provide you the promise to work another seven years. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. A week after Jacob had married Leah, Leban gave uh, him Rachel too. So see, he was supposed to marry Rachel, and the father promised him, he worked his seven years, but then he tricked him and sent Leah down the aisle instead, and he didn't even know he married Leah. So here he married the second born instead of the first born, and he wasn't real happy about it. Now, again, was this what he wanted, or was this what God wanted? Now, because I want you to look at Leah and Rachel. If you look at Leah, because here's Rachel, Rachel couldn't have children Again, Leah could. Leah started having boys like this. Let's look at Leah's sons, if you'll go to Leah. And then look at her sons. Here's Leah's sons. Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah. These are some pretty important people. So do you think this was God's plan? Because it wasn't Jacob's plan. Jacob wanted Rachel. But you see, God had a different plan. He wanted Leah because she was gonna bear. This is actually where the lineage of Jesus comes through Leah's children. That's how God had a plan. But that's not the plan Jacob wanted. So when Rachel couldn't have children, here she was. She was jealous at her sister. She was mad at Leah because she couldn't. I mean, she was mad, okay? Like, I mean, in Genesis 30, uh, verses one, two, three, it literally says she was so jealous and so mad. And he was like, hey, this is what you wanted. This was your plan because she said, I can't bear children. Have them with my sister, have them with my servant. And now she's mad at the plan. So Rachel has Joseph. So she finally bears a child named Joseph. Now, this is where we're gonna land today on Joseph. Because if you go back, and every one of these women, you go to Sarah, 
you go to Rebecca, you go to Rachel. It's very fascinating to me that none of them could bear children. And when they couldn't, they came up with their own plan. Every time. Go sleep with my servant. Maybe that's the way God wanted it. And every time that happened, they regretted it every single time. When we think of patience and we think of path, patience is a path. It's a path of molding and maturing and preparing. And sometimes it can be a long path and we don't like the molding and we don't like the waiting. We just want it to happen. And so I believe God had a plan. But when they couldn't get what they wanted, they didn't want to be patient anymore. They don't want to be molded, right? They didn't want to mature through it. They wanted their own way. And they skipped out of the path of patience and they made their own plan. Now, what's fascinating about all these women, they're raising sons. They're raising sons. And you see how their sons even carry some of those traits onto their next family. If you look, because I don't believe when you go back to Isaac, I think Isaac was meant to grow up with Ishmael. Because isn't that what brothers do? They, they, learn, to, they learn about conflict. They learn to compromise. They learn they don't always get their way. They don't learn they're the center of everyone's world, right? That one that brothers are good for. They take you down a few notches, right? When you're dumb, they just hit you. But see, Isaac grew up with a mom that any conflict that came near him, she got rid of it because she didn't want the molding. She wanted to be the molder, right? She wanted to be in control of his life instead of allow God to mold him and to mature him and to prepare him. So then when he goes to marry a wife and has these two sons, what does he do? He fathers the way he was raised. I have a favorite. I'm just gonna focus on one. So that's what my mom did. My mom, she didn't like the other boy. She got rid of him, so I'll just ignore the other one. I'll just focus on this one. And then Rebecca, what does a mom do? Well, of course she's gonna love the one that the father doesn't love as much. And then he became her favorite. And already you see where the boys did not learn to deal with conflict and compromise. They didn't know how to be patient. They made their own way happen. Now, we're gonna land on Joseph, because this is what I love about Joseph. You talk about patience. Joseph entered a complete path of patience. Okay, now remember, he had these brothers that didn't like him. If you don't know the story, there's these brothers that got tired of Joseph because he, you know, was the favorite. And the brothers were like, we're tired of him. Let's get rid of him. Now, you can be mad at the brothers. But remember, these are Leah's sons. I think Leah's sons probably knew that their father didn't love Leah, their mom. So that's why they probably didn't like Joseph. So don't give them too hard of a time. They were probably protecting their mom, like, we need to get rid of this boy because he's Rachel's and dad loves him and we're just sick of hearing him talk about how wonderful he is wearing his special little coat. They were like, let's get rid of him, right? Because that's what mamas do, right? We buy him something special. And the dad had this, and it just marked him as the favorite. And the other brothers were tired of it. I think they just got done with it. They knew their mom wasn't loved as much. They knew they weren't loved as much, and they were just done. So they sold Joseph. First they were gonna kill him, then they sold him. And then here's Joseph going through the path of patience. You talk about molding. You talk about maturing. This part, he was sold as a slave. He became a slave, was a great slave. Potiphar's wife hit on him, right? He denied her. She lied. He got thrown into prison. I mean, you talk about patience. What I love about Joseph, if you read the story of Joseph, he never curses God through the process. He never says, take this away from me. He never says, get me off this path. I don't want to be molded. I don't want to mature. Every step that he is either rejected or imprisoned or falsely accused, he just keeps on the path. He just keeps on the path. Because see, I think Joseph knew there was something in the end. 
he was willing to be molded. He was okay that he had to wait to be matured. That process was not like a year or two. We're talking like 13 years of this path of patience for Joseph because this is what you guys cannot miss. Don't miss this. Joseph was really the first one that accepted his path of patience. He was the first son that finally surrendered and didn't look at patience as the enemy, but he looked at patience as a path that God had for him. And even though sometimes it was no, sometimes it was wait, sometimes it was like go the other way. Some of you are in a process. Don't jump the process of patience. Don't make your own way. Look at these women in the Bible. They learn from them. Now, I have respect for these women, but I'm telling you, their stories are not here just to read. They're here to learn. And God put these women in the Bible to learn from them. When they didn't like their path of patience, they made their own plan. It never worked out. And most of the time, their sons are the one that suffered. Moms, listen, I have four. I know it is not my job to make my kids happy. I love my babies. But it is my job to mold them, to mature them, and to prepare them. And it's so much easier when they don't get their way. Oh, it's the teacher's fault. Well, she didn't teach you right. How dare you flunk? I'm gonna email her right now. How dare you not get on that team? That, he's a bad coach. I'm gonna let that coach know. Oh, we've all done it. How dare that boy talk to you like that? He's not your friend, that's not a real friend. Anytime there's conflict, what do we want to do? Send it away. Can we learn from Sarah? Sarah sent the problem away, and I think he was meant to be with his brother. And that makes me sad because he could have learned so much from having a brother around, but mama didn't want conflict or anything bad to come around her baby, so she sent it away. And sometimes as moms, It's so much easier to make your kids happy. I get it. But that is not why we are here, and that's not why we became mothers. And I know it's tough to say no. I've got teenage girls. I know it's hard to say no and what you get in return. You don't get, you're right, mama. Such a good mama. (laughs) You're so wise. You're so right. (laughs) No, I know, I get it. You don't get that in return, it's hard. You wanna make them happy because you love them. But love is keeping them on that path. You've got to make them walk that path. And when they don't get the answer they want, you look at them and you say, well, what responsibility do you have? How can you learn from it? Well, let's look at it from their point of view. Have you thought about it from another? Instead of saying, Automatically, as moms, sometimes we say, well, it's their fault. Because we want to make them happy. And then when they're out on their own, and they can't make decisions, they don't know how to deal with conflict, and they keep getting fired, and they don't know how to talk to their boss face to face, and they don't know how to do, and we wonder why. Because for 18 years, we just wanted to make them happy. But you learn them, you make them stand and deal with conflict. You make them look people in the eye and talk to them when they're not happy with their grade. You say, go talk to your teacher face to face and ask her what you can do. You don't say, let mama email. I'm gonna email that teacher. Can you tell I used to be a teacher? I'm gonna, come on, parents, you teach your children the path of patience. And that's not getting what they want, that's teaching them that it's a process. It's a process. And like I said, let's learn from these mamas. These are some crazy mamas. I may start a Bible study, crazy mamas. I mean, we could learn from, but we can learn from them. And it's powerful. Because look at Joseph. When we get to Joseph, 
This is powerful. When we get to Joseph and he goes through the process and he's molded and he matures and then he's prepared and God makes him ruler of Egypt. He gets a wife. Now this is fascinating. It never says his wife could not bear children. Immediately he has two sons. What? Because Joseph was willing to walk the path of patience and God blessed him for it. And yes, we've all made mistakes and, and, and maybe you're thinking, oh, why? well, if I could start over and I understand, I think that all the time, we do that as moms. Oh, if only, it's never too late. It's never too late. But let me read something about Joseph because this is so powerful. Okay. Genesis 48, this, okay, this is so crazy. So guess what? Joseph, his dad didn't even know he was still alive. Remember that. So when Joseph finds out that his dad, Jacob, is still alive, he wants him to bless his two sons. So he brings Jacob, he says, please pray over. I mean, his dad is old, okay? But I think that's pretty powerful that he brought his father back. Remember, he brought his father back and said, will you bless my sons before you die? Now, don't miss this. Okay, Genesis 48, verse 10, verse 10. I want to get your phone. Happy, tell them Happy Mother's Day, whatever it is. <laughs> so sweet. I love it. I don't forget to turn my phone off all the time. It's horrible. Okay, Genesis 48, 10. Uh, this is a lot of verses. I'm going to read super fast, but I just want you to get it because I'm telling you, this is powerful. This is so powerful. Okay, Genesis 48, verse 10. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. If I become really old, let's not print that I was half blind and could not see, okay? Like, you can just, like, that's not necessary, okay? So Joseph brought the boys. He brought his boys close to him, and Jacob kissed him. And he embraced him. Then he, Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I'd see your face again, but now God has let me see your children. Because when you follow the path of patience, God will bring it back and bless you where you thought you lost and you actually won. So here he is. Here he is. Joseph moves the boys who were at their grandfather's knees. He bowed with his face to the ground and he positioned the boys in the front of Jacob with his right hand towards Ephraim and Joseph's left hand towards Manassas at Jacob's right hand. But Jacob crossed his arms and reached out to lay his hands on the boy's heads. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, then was the younger boy, and he put his left hand on Manassas when he was the firstborn. And then he blessed Joseph and said, may the God before my grandfather, Abraham, and my father, Isaac, he's going back. Okay, generation, generation, remember that. May they preserve my name. Uh, oh, wait, the angel <laughs> redeem me from all harm. May he bless these boys. May they preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac. He's like, he wants them to go back and undo the stuff. May their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. But Joseph was upset. He saw that his father placed his right hand, it's on the younger boy, Ephraim's head. So Jason, Joseph lifted it up and moved it He's like, no, 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 this is the firstborn. You got it wrong. But the father refused. He said, I know my son. I know. Manassas will always become a great people, but his younger brother will become even greater and his descendants will become a multitude of nations. So Jacob blessed the boys that day with a blessing. The people of Israel will use their names when they give a blessing, they will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manassas. In this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manassas. Now why? Now remember, Jacob's from a family. Jacob is the one that tricked his brother out of his birthright, who lied to his father. Now here's his chance to make it right. And he said, I want to go back from generation to generation because it's not about a custom. 
or the firstborn. I want it to be about God. Because I believe that was his way of undoing all that mess of what he had done to get what he wanted and his, the plan and the tricking and the lying and the running and the hiding. I feel like it was his chance to say, no, it's not about a custom and who should have this. It's about God. And it's about the process of following God and whatever the plan is, I want these boys to follow it. It was his way of undoing generation after generation after generation. Now I'm gonna give you one thing to do. Because this is the challenge. And it's not just for moms, it's for all of us. You want the gift of patience? Because sometimes we think patience is just, oh, I have to stand here and wait. That's part of it. But when we to what does Pastor Brian always talk about? These are gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's much deeper than that. If you want the gift of patience, then you've got to allow the process of molding, maturing, and preparation to happen in God's timing. So mamas, I know what it's like for kids to be hurt. There's been times where any of my kids have been hurt. And I, even to the point where I've said, oh, I've only said this one time, but I said, if this is what it's about, I don't know if I wanna do this. And that's just my, your natural instinct to protect. So I don't give Sarah too hard of a time. It's what we do, right? But then after that moment, you go to God and you say, God, I don't know why. My kid is struggling. Maybe they're struggling with grades. Maybe they're struggling with addiction. Maybe they're, God, I don't know why you put my kid in this class. I don't know why my kid has this teacher. I don't know why my kid has this coach right now. I'm not for sure why my kid has no friends right now. I'm not, but God, I trust you. And I want them to learn to be patient. So I know you're molding them. I know you're maturing them. And I know you're preparing them, God. My hands are off. They're yours. And I'm okay with that. So sometimes as moms, you've got to deny your own feeling. I just want them to be happy because it makes me feel good. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to have to give that up. Feeling good, it just is there and it's gone. But knowing they're in God's hands and you're trusting God is so much more fulfilling. And I understand it may not be what you want, but put them in God's hands and teach him to stay on that path so God can prepare them for what's next. Because God has a calling. I tell those kids back there, I don't know what you're telling them, but I know what I'm telling them. Every single Sunday we say, you're gonna make a difference. You have a calling, you have a purpose. God has a plan for you. You're gonna change someone's life. I tell them that, and Miss Susie tells, we tell them that every single Sunday because it's true. And God does have a plan for their life, but that plan comes with patience. And it may not work out all the time the way you want the plan to work out, but let's just put them on that path and say, God, they're yours, they're yours. And I'm just gonna trust you through the process of patience. Patience is not an enemy. It's just a process. And I don't know about you, but I know I even wanna make sure I'm walking on that path every day. Even when things, you know, it's not, everyone has jobs that has struggles. And you know, you may have good days, you have bad days. You, you know, marriages have good days and bad days. Raising kids have good days, I, I get it. But this is what I know. 
I know that I'm in God's will and I trust God, even in the bad days. God, this is a process. I don't get it right now, but I'm just trusting you because you're molding, you're maturing. I'm trusting you. I wanna stay patient. I wanna stay true. I wanna stay on the path. I don't wanna get off of it, God. I trust you in this process. That's what it is to walk with God. And sometimes you don't always get the answers when you want them, but that's your faith. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're not gonna stand yet, but we, I always do this. We're gonna pray. We do this every single Sunday for anyone that's never asked Jesus into your heart. We do this in kids ministry too. I have some kids, they get saved every single Sunday. That's so sweet. I'm like, oh, sweetie, that's like number 50 for you. <laughs> so sweet. That's so cute. But we do this every single Sunday because I never want anybody to miss an opportunity that you were here and you're like, you know, she keeps talking about this Jesus and God, but I don't know if I even have him in my life. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna dim the lights a little bit and we're just gonna pray a simple prayer. But before I do, um, so, you know, I was, got saved in a youth group. That's why Next Gen Ministry, I'm super passionate about Next Gen Ministry. And that's because it was a youth pastor that I got saved under. And if it wasn't for a youth group, I don't know if I would have got saved later in life. I don't know. I'm thankful I don't have to think about it. And I went to a youth group. I wasn't raised. My parents weren't saved at the time. They weren't going to church. And I went to a youth group and I got saved and it changed my whole life, my whole life. So I never want to miss an opportunity that if you've never had the opportunity, today's your day. I could tell you, can't tell you the exact day, but I can tell you exactly where I was the first time I gave Jesus a chance. And that was in a church gym, it was carpeted. I thought that was weird, it smelled, but I got on my knees and he said, well, does anyone ask Jesus in your heart? And I was like, sure. And I said a simple little prayer, Jesus come my life. I don't know if you're real, but I'm gonna try this out. That was pretty much it. And that's all it took. See, it does not fancy prayer. It's just an honest heart that just says, I don't know if I believe you, but I really wanna try. So I wanna close our eyes. If you're here today and you're like, I'm not for sure if Jesus is in my life or not, but I want today to be the day that I say, come into my life. And I wanna give him a chance. So if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand up real simple. Just raise your hand up. And then we're just gonna say a simple little prayer. So just, repeat, I want everyone to repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I wanna make you the Lord of my life, my father, my friend, my savior. And thank you for what you have done for me. Amen. Now, this is the last prayer I wanna pray. I want all my mamas to stand up. All my mamas that are here. If I have to stand up here, you can stand up, right? All my mamas. Now, we're gonna change. I want all the women to stand up, even if you're not a mama. Because I've got three girls that might be a mama one day. They may choose not to be a mama, that's up to them. And some of you, maybe you're not a mama yet, but you wanna be. Some of you are spiritual mamas. Thank you. For you that help out on youth on Wednesdays and kids ministry and mentoring young ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I just want to pray a blessing over you today. And I want you in those times where you have to make a decision with your kid or with a person you're mentoring that God will give you wisdom and you can ask yourself, am I trying to make them happy and make it easier for them? Or am I directing them to stay on that path and to let God be the one? Because it's hard. So God, right now, I pray over my mamas and all the ladies and all the women that are standing, God. What a powerful moment, God. God, I'm so thankful for girls and ladies and women that serve you and love you. Bless them today, God. Bless them 
Let them know their love, their chosen, their call, their anointed. God, they have a plan. God, but those that are raising children, God, give them strength. God, give them courage. God, even in those moments, God, where it's hard and it's so much easier just to make the moment go away or don't deal with it or make them happy and then you don't have to deal with all the other stuff that comes with it. God, give them strength in those moments when God, you're right there and you're saying, just let me mold them. Let me mature them, let them be mine. God, let these mamas give their kids back and say, God, they're yours. I deny my happiness, God, to give them back to you because they're your children, God. So give them strength in those moments that are so hard. But God, bless them and let them know, God, that you're there and you're gonna give them the strength that they need to raise these children to go out and make a difference, God. We pray for mamas, God, their children don't live with them anymore. Maybe they're out on their own, God. Maybe we've got moms here today, God, they don't even know where their children are. They're not speaking to them. God, bless those moms, God. God, don't let them walk out of here feeling discouraged. God, let them walk out of here feeling there's hope and there's love for their children. God, there is nothing like the prayers of a mama to bring the children back to you. So encourage them to keep praying and believing for their children, God. Don't let them give up. So God, bless these women today, God, and everybody said, amen.